So, uh, of course, the question I hope should be in English because we don't have much time to translate into Malay and then I, to translate from Malay to English. So it will waste lots of time. So English question, you describe your profession. If you're a student, say I'm a student from uh, Marine Science course, for example. Okay. And your name and then your question straight away. Okay, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Chong from Food Technologies, undergraduate student from UMT. And I have a question from, uh, it's about a phenomena that already happens, not obviously, but it occurs every to everyone. In the, for those, uh, among all of the religions and others, uh, not only for Muslim, Buddhist, and other uh, Hinduism, the phenomena is most of us are more concerned about going to the church or mosque and have, having a wish to the God and maybe hope that the God will give the, give the things that we want uh, without any action or anything. Because this phenomena is very occurs to uh, very already bear in our minds. Most, uh, for me, in my point of view, is that uh, we believe God because God is a mirror to us so that we can ask him a question or uh, any wish so that we can uh, in our inside they can arrest uh, energies or knowledge and strength to help us to overcome this problem but I can see that most of us having uh, a very wrong concept in this phenomena so if Dr. Jake have uh, agree with this, can give uh, advice. If not, can give uh, some explain in details. Huh? Brother, if I understood the question correctly, we have most of the religions have a phenomena where they go to a place of worship, whether it be the church, whether it be a mosque, and then they pray to Almighty God and they ask for what they want. That's what. So what's your question? I understood the phenomena. What's the question? Can you on the microphone, please? Yes, can you? Okay. What's the your question, question? Is why become uh, why people will uh, become like this? Uh, in all, in other ways, actually, we want to have a belief in God that we can uh, the God will give us a strength and knowledge about how to overcome. Why? Recently, most of us, even the youngsters, why they can't have a, this kind of mind that uh, we have a wish to the God, maybe the God will give what we want in letters without any, taking any actions. Why this phenomenon uh, happens now, so, now today? If I understand the question correctly, he's saying, why do people go to church or mosque? Why do they pray? Why is the reason? The reason is because they know that God is the creator, he is the supreme being, he is all powerful and he can grant us what we want. The difference normally is when the people go to pray to the place of worship, it's called as prayer. Whether in Christianity it's called as prayer, in Hinduism it's called as prayer, in Islam we call it as salah. salah. Now the word salah, many people translate to pray is not the correct definition because to pray in english language is to beseech to ask for help so when a christian goes to church he asks for help therefore you call it a prayer we muslims when we come for salah the word salah is much more than asking for help the dua that we do after the salah is actually prayer but in our salah besides asking for help we even thank allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we get guidance Therefore, I prefer calling Salah as the programming towards righteousness. So when we come for Salah, for example, the Imam, the leader, he recites for a Fatiha, the opening chapter. And after that, he may recite for a Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 90, which says, Ya ayyolazina amun, O you believe, innamal khamru wal maisuru, most certainly intoxicants and gambling, wal anzabal azlamu, dedication of stones, divination of arrows, these are Satan's handiwork. 
abstain from the handiwork that you may prosper. So here, when the people come for salah, they are getting guidance from Almighty God. They do not drink alcohol. Do not gamble. Do not do idol worship. Do not do fortune telling. These are Satan's handiwork, abstain from it. There are the verses of the Quran which say do not cheat, do not tell lies, be honest, be kind, be merciful. So in our salah, it is much more than asking for help. Besides asking for help, we are getting guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we also thank him. Therefore, I call this as a programming towards righteousness and every Muslim minimum should offer salah minimum five times a day. Why? Some religions are once a week, some are once a day. We have five times a day. Why? If you allow me to call the human being a machine, you agree it's the most complicated machine, more complicated than the computer. Now, normally when you program a computer, the program runs unless there is a virus. If a virus comes, then you have to reprogram it, correct? Now, here when we come for salah, when we go out, we see around us so much of ill things happening. So much of wrong things happening. That's the reason our God, our Creator knows that we should be programmed minimum five times a day to be on the straight path. That's the reason in our Salah we say, Ehdina Sirat al Mustaqeen. Show us the straight path. The path of those who have earned their favor, not the path of those who have gone astray. So here in a Salah, besides asking for help, we are also thanking Almighty God and we are also getting guidance from Him. For example, I ask you, why do you have three meals a day? What? Why do you have three times food a day? Three, three times what? Food, food. Food. Because uh, provide energy and also uh, rebuild our, our cells. Very good. Provide energy, rebuild our cells to give us health. Same way for spiritual soul, for reconfirming and rebuilding a spiritual soul, minimum we have to come five times a day. That is the reason we come to the mosque. <laughs> Who says this? Our creator. That is the reason if you read the Bible in the book of Daniels, it says that you have to pray to God thrice. But Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, says you have to pray to God unseasonally, as many times as you want. But the church has said Sunday. I don't know why. Nowhere in the Bible did Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, say pray only on Sunday. Pray unseasonally. Pray as much as you can. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa came and said minimum five times. If you want, you can pray more. You can pray tajud. You can, you can pray shakh. Mashallah. Allah sir. Minimum five times. Because this is food for our soul. So that we remain on the straight path. And we are obedient to our creator. And we behave as good human beings and good Muslims. Hope that answers the question. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. If there are any non-Muslim like to ask a question, as the coordinator said, we prefer non-Muslims first to ask questions because they're guests of honors. You can ask any questions on Islam. You can even criticize Islam. If you want, you can attack the Quran. I'm young. I can take it. No problem. Any questions you have regarding Islam, this is your opportunity. Please come to the microphone. The ladies' mic is on my right. The gents on the left. We give first opportunity to the non-Muslims. The non-Muslims can ask any question on Islam, even out of the topic, no problem. Any question on Christianity, on Hinduism, any question on Buddhism, this is the opportunity. I will try my best to reply. Yes, sister. Uh, good morning, Dr. Zake. I'm Tan Wai, uh, from third year from Biology Marine. I have a question. Uh, I think, I hope you can answer it. I'm, first of all, I would like to uh, clarify that I'm not here to challenge anyone because uh, this is a question I've been asking since I was a child. I've been always, I'm, I always have faith in God and I believe in God. But as a child, I always ask, how does this even begin? I mean, how do we you know, uh, begin to believe in God? Like, the, who's the first one to like, know the existence of God? And then, nowadays we can see that especially the younger generation is uh, losing faith in God and I would like to know why. Uh, so basically, that's my question. Thank you. Sister, which background do you come from? 
Are you a Christian or a? I'm a Buddhist actually. You're a Buddhist. Just ask the question that who was the first person who came to know the existence of God? And today youngsters are losing faith in God. The first one who came to the existence of God is God himself. He is the first, he is the last, and he is uncreated. He created many things amongst which are the human beings. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Dariyat, chapter 51, verse number 56, that we have created the men and the jinn, not but to worship him. So we are here in this world to worship our great almighty God. And this life sister, as Allah says in the Quran in Surah Mulk, chapter number 67, verse number 2, It is he who has created death and life to test which of you is good in deeds. This life that we are leading in this world sister is a test for the hereafter. It's a test for the hereafter. Like how you appear for an examination. In the examination, you follow the rules and regulation. And if you score, minimum marks is there for passing. If you score the passing mark, then you pass the test. Otherwise, you fail the test. So similarly, in this world, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Almighty God, is the creator of all this creation, including the human beings who are one of the best of his creation. And the rules and regulation of this examination is being given in the Quran. This Quran is a textbook. It is the constitution. And if you follow the commandments of Almighty God given in this Quran, which is the last and final revelation, you pass the test. Regarding the existence of God, tomorrow I'm going to give a lecture on does God exist? It's a lecture of about one and a half to two hours. I don't intend giving it here. If you have the time, I would invite you to that lecture. Does God exist? And there have proof to the people scientifically, logically, and convince them the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Almighty God. Now coming to your second part of the question, that why are today youngsters losing faith in God? I do agree with you that there are many youngsters losing faith in God, but many youngsters are coming closer to Almighty God also. The reason is, sister, the gods that people worship around us. You know, in some religion they say, one god is fighting with the other god, one god is defeating the other god, one god's wife is taken away, one god is tortured, a god that can die. So, a logical person starts thinking, what type of god is this? A god which can be defeated by someone else, a God which can die, a God which requires to eat. So when you start looking at the gods that people are worshipping around you, you disagree with it. What is the use in worshipping a dog? A God which is not powerful, a God which can be hurt, a God which can be tortured, a God which requires to eat, a God which requires to sleep, a God which requires food and in the earlier talk my son Farik he gave a few concepts of anthropomorphism etc trying to prove <clears throat> that Islam is against such qualities of God in Islam as my son said the definition of God is give, given in Surah Ikhlas chapter number 112 verse number 1 to 4 which says Kul ho Allah ad says Allah one and only. Allah who summoned. Allah the absolute and eternal. Lam yiriz wa lam yulad. He begets not nor is he begotten. Wa lam yakul lahu kuffana. There is nothing like him. This is the four line definition of Almighty God given in the Quran. If anyone claims that so and so entity is God, if that candidate fits in this four line definition, we Muslims have got no objection accepting him to be God. So because of the wrong concept of God in different religions, they are not agreeing with this God. And even I don't agree with a God which can be defeated, a God which can be hurt, a God which can die. But if you know the correct concept of Almighty God, 
the all-powerful, who's one, who's absolute and eternal, who begets not noise begotten, and there's nothing like him, you will start having faith in this God. So I do agree with you that many of the logical people with the concept of God that is floating in the world today, in most of the religion, a normal, logical human being will not believe in such a God which has human qualities. But if you know the true concept of God, which was explained partly by my son in religion in the right perspective, you will start having more faith in God. So that's the reason knowing the correct concept of God is very important, sister. And once you know the correct concept of God, you will come closer to this creator, your creator, your sustainer, your cherisher, which in Arabic we call as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hope that answers the question, sister. Okay, uh, um, hello, uh, Dr. Zaki. Yeah, nice to meet you. Uh, my name is Kelvin. Um, I'm not a student from here. Um, I'm a Christian. And I would like to ask a um, few questions. First, it's about the law. I would like to ask about the Sharia law. And then, um, you see in Malaysia, for example, Malaysia have a dualistic kind of law. One is the civil law, and the other one is the Sharia law. And the problem is when there is a case of apostasy, for example, um, whether, whether it's a non-Muslim convert to a Muslim, or whether it's a Muslim themselves want to, to be a non-Muslim or atheist or whatever it is, there is like a, for me, I, I sense that this um, this kind of law is is not is not suitable because you are restrict the people to believe whatever they want and you restrict people from disbelief whatever they think is is not true for them. So my question is, um, even for example, uh, I give case in some other places the the. The punishment for apostasy is death. It, and some other cases, they will, they will um, send, send the apostate to the counseling for three years and be in jail, for example. So, is, is that true that uh, whether according to hadiths or Quran, whether that um, whether the punishment for apostasy must be death or not. And the other question is, um, if, if the Quran itself say that in Surah 2, verse 2, 5, 6, there is no compulsion in Islam, then why, why Muslims restrict people to believe whatever they want, to disbelieve when the religion doesn't suit him or her? So that's my first question. There was a question on apostasy and said that what is the punishment for a person who is a Muslim and becomes a non-Muslim, that is murtad? Uh, is it death penalty? Is it putting in the jail for three years for counseling? What is the punishment and why is it so? Doesn't it contradict with the verse of the Quran or Surah Baqarah chapter 2 verse 256 which says that there is no compulsion in religion? What you're quoting, brother, as I said, is the verse of the Quran from Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 256, which clearly says, There is no compulsion in religion. But the verse continues. Truth stands out clear from error. Truth stands out clear from error. If you hold the hand of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He will take you from darkness to light. If you hold the hand of the Satan, He will take you from light to darkness. That's the complete verse. What you quoted is the first part of the verse. And this verse of the Quran, like Rafiddin, there's no compulsion in religion, means you cannot compel anyone to become a Muslim. You can't take a gun and tell a person accept Islam, that is prohibited. You can't force anyone to accept Islam. But once a person accepts Islam, he has to follow the rules and regulation of that religion. You cannot force anyone to become a Muslim. But once you become a Muslim, if you say you're a Muslim, you have to follow the rules and regulation. 
For example, you are studying in some other university. When you join this university of Malaysia, Terengganu, you have to follow the rules and regulation or not. You cannot say, no, I don't want to follow. If you fo come here, you have to follow. If you, end, if you take admission in a school, and if they say you have to wear the school uniform, you have to wear. That is the rule of the school. Similar in Islam, no one can force you to become a Muslim. But once you say you are a Muslim, then you have to follow the rules and regulation of that religion. Now coming to your main question. What is the punishment? And in Islam, for apostasy, I would like to give an example. In most of the countries in the world, for treason, if someone sells the secrets of a company, or sorry, of the country, maybe a soldier working in the army, sells the secret of that army to the enemy, in most of the country, most of the countries in the world, either he gets a death penalty or life imprisonment. You'll ask me, why is this? This is the law of the country. You want to sell the secrets of the country to someone else. This is the law. You can't say, no, I don't believe. If you are a citizen of the country, you have to follow the law. You cannot say death penalty is too harsh, life in prison is too harsh. So in Islam, once you accept Islam, if you change to any other religion, that is called as murtab. It's apostasy. So in Islam, we have to follow the rules, same like how most of the countries have for treason, death penalty, or maybe life imprisonment. Islam also has a severe punishment. This is the law. And I believe it's logical. It's not forcing anyone to accept Islam, but once you accept Islam, you have to follow the rules and regulation. Hope so, that's the question. So you mean that if the Muslim for example, if the Muslim realizes that, that Islam is not the truth to himself and then decide to, to become a non-Muslim or apostate, then are you trying to say that this person needs to be killed for refuse to disbelieve Islam? I did not say he has to be killed and you and I cannot kill him. It is the law of the country where he's living. If he's living in the law of the country, if he's in India, no problem with him. Depending in which country is he living. Did I tell you every different country has a different law? So if it is the law of the country which says he should be arrested and put in jail and should be given counseling and then put to death, that is the law of the country. I cannot object why is USA putting someone to death for certain crime. If you don't like the country, you leave the country. If you are a citizen of that country and because Quran clearly states in Surah Imran, chapter 3, verse number 19, in Nadina in the Lyal Islam, the only religion acceptable in the sight of Allah is Islam. People tell me that why doesn't Saudi Arabia allow anyone else to propagate their religion? I tell them Saudi Arabia calls many foreigners. Yes, about 8 million foreigners. They call the Westerners for science and technology, for medicine, doctors, engineers. But where the religion is concerned, they know that their deen is correct. For example, if you are a principal of a school and you want to appoint a maths teacher, the first teacher says 2 plus 2 is equal to 3. Second teacher says 2 plus 2 is equal to 4. The third teacher says 2 plus 2 is equal to 5. I'm asking the question, which teacher will you appoint? Which teacher would you appoint, the first, second or third? Which teacher would you appoint the teacher that says 2 plus 2 is equal to 3 or 2 plus 2 is equal to 4 or 2 plus 2 is equal to 5? Of course, 2 plus 2 equals to 4. Why? Yeah, because... Why not the one who says 2 plus 2 is 3? <laughs> uh -huh. Okay, um, yeah, no, it's, why? It's, a, it's, because, a, it's fine. It's a, it's because a hermetic logic. Yes, you, it's a, you know maths yeah. and you're confident 2 plus 2 is 4, not 3 or 5, correct? So same yeah. way we Muslims are confident the only religion that is correct from Almighty God is Islam. That the reason I say, I tell, okay, um, I tell, okay. I tell in my lectures mm. that if anyone proves to me a religion better than Islam, I will accept it. I am not speaking on behalf of the other Muslims. I am a student of comparative religion. I have studied Christianity. I have studied Hinduism. I have studied Buddhism. I am a student of comparative religion. Some people say it's just kufr. It's not kufr. Allah says in the Quran, if Allah had a son, I would be the first person to bow down. That means Allah cannot have a son. I know very well I am a student of comparative religion. That Islam is the only religion which has the solution for the problems of humanity. You get me a religion better than Islam, I will accept it. 
So yeah, you mean uh, okay to conclude the the question about the apostasy thing mean that it is it is not a mandatory you mean that the punishment is depend on the country it's not mandatory from from God is it the punishment? No. I said for this world by God by our hadith it is clearly that the prophet said that person who leaves the religion try to get him back give him chance counsel him if he doesn't then it he should be put to death that's very clear in the hadith okay. but the country is following which law not you and i cannot do it it has a sharia law that it has to go to a court has to go to a qazi he integrates it then he listens to him he gives them an opportunity he gives them time and then all these procedures are there it's not just you know one two three it's a procedure to be followed which is given in detail in the laws of the sharia hope that answers the question Okay, um, can I ask another question? You're most welcome. Um, I would like to ask, um, uh, uh, there's, there's some dispute among the Muslim scholars whether, whether, whether the Quran is eternal or uncreated. So, in, according to my understanding of this dispute, if you, something is uncreated, so something is eternal, then it's already equate to God. So, what is your opinion of it? Is it that, that it is a part of Allah or it is just a mechanism of Allah or it is a nature of Allah? Yeah. Masha, mashallah, brother is asking questions on Islam. So I believe you have studied Islam. Yeah, I, I do study. I do study for my... Yes. my I, because I seek and, the truth also. And yeah. mashallah. And I pray to Allah that may guide you to truth. May Allah give you hidayah. As far as the question is concerned, there's difference of opinion in scholars. There's no difference of opinion in scholars. There's difference of opinion in some of the Muslims, not scholars. Scholar is a person who knows the Quran and Hadith very well. So scholar will not differ in this aspect. It is very clear cut that the Quran is the word of Almighty God. So if it's the word of Almighty God, there's no question that it will perish. It is there. Because all the created things of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will perish. So Quran is the word of Almighty God. The word so, itself is, is, is a created or uncreated? It, word is word. Nothing. It is word. Yeah. It's not creation. Creation so, is creation and word is word. So what Allah says is kalamullah, word. That's it. Now people misunderstand it and think it's the creation. And that is the reason there is a difficulty in understanding because the Quran says every created thing will perish. It's the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there's no question of it perishing. Hope that answers the question. Then, then, then to the Christian, Jesus is the word of God. So from John verse chapter 1 and 1. So, and the word was with God and the word was God. So why, what is this? Asking a question, I'm not finishing and you're saying oppose, oppose. I did not. Bible chapter one of Gospel of John. If I agree with you, you're thinking that the that in the beginning was the word was it? God. And the word was God. When I translate the word into God, it will be in the beginning was God. Now for your information, you may not as knowledgeable in your Do you know the meaning of Hontios and Tontios? Sorry? Do you know the meaning of Tontios? Or Hotios? Uh. Antiochs. You know, I'll help you. The original Bible, you know that. Yeah. Uh, you mean uh, the original text of the Bible? Okay. It is not English. What we have is the translation. Same thing. This Quran has the Arabic original text. English is the translation, not the word of God. The Arabic is the word of God. And for God, they use the word Hotios. God is the capital G. And Tontios means a God. A God means can be a messenger. Or someone which is God. So in the big that is Hotios or capital G. And the word God meaning a messenger. Actually says that the Bible, not a single unambiguous statement. In the complete Bible, where Jesus Christ peace be upon himself says that I am God or where he says worship me. If you can point out a single unequivocal statement, a single unambiguous statement from anywhere in the Bible where Jesus Christ, peace be upon himself, says, 
I am God, or why says worship me? I, Dr. Zakir Naik, am ready to accept Christianity today. I am not speaking on behalf of my Muslim brothers and sisters. I am a student of comparative religion. I have studied your Bible. I am asking you to point out a single, not two, a single unequivocal statement, a single unambiguous statement from anywhere in the Bible where Jesus Christ, peace be upon himself, says that I am God, or where he says worship me, I am ready to accept Christianity. Because I love Jesus Christ. I revere him. I respect him. I follow him more than you. I follow the teachings of Jesus Christ more than you. Islam is the only non-Christian faith which makes an article of faith to believe in Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. We believe that he was one of the mightiest messengers of Almighty God. We believe that he was a Messiah translated Christ. We believe that he was born miraculously without any male intervention, which many modern day Christians today do not believe. We believe that he gave life to the dead with God's permission. We believe that he healed those born blind and lepers with God's permission. The Christians and the Muslims, we are going together. But one may ask, then where is the parting of ways? The parting of ways is that most of the Christians, like you also, believe that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, claimed divinity, that he was God. And as I told you, there is not a single unequal statement in the complete Bible where Jesus Christ, peace be upon himself, says that I am God or what says worship me. In fact, if you read the Bible, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, clearly said, it's mentioned in the Gospel of John, chapter number 14, verse number 28. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, my father is greater than I. Gospel of John, chapter number 10, verse number 29, my father is greater than all. Gospel of Luke, chapter number 11, verse number 20, I cast out devil with the finger of God. Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 12, verse number 38, I cast out devil with the spirit of God. Gospel of John, chapter number 5, verse number 30, I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just. But I seek not my will, but the will of my father. Anyone who says, who seeks not my will, but the will of Almighty God, he's a Muslim. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, is a Muslim. And the Quran says in Surah, Surah Al Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 52, that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, is a Muslim. He never claimed divinity. It's mentioned in the book of Acts, chapter number 2, verse number 22. E men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God amongst you by wonders and miracles and signs, which God did by him, and you owe it to it. A man approved of God amongst you by wonders and miracles and signs, which God did by him, and you owe it to it. So Jesus Christ, peace be upon never claimed divinity, yet you're saying he's God. So when you're searching for the truth, brother, Nowhere in the Bible Jesus said that he is God. Nowhere. So why do you believe he is God? If you are a man searching for the truth, when you find the truth, you should accept it. Right or wrong? Um, but in another statement of Jesus, he did claim his divinity. But not Show direct. me one. Show me one. Unequivocal. Direct. No indirect. Direct is direct. Why? Jesus felt scared to say I am God if he was God. When he claimed that he is the I am he, to the to the Jews is a is a I am he. It's a blasphemy. That's why I am he. That's why they they like to cast a stone because that Jesus himself tried to equate himself as God by use by using the statement I am. I am. You are confused. You are quoting one verse from Gospel of John, which I am yeah, uh, what I am. And another quoting, casting of stone is in Gospel of John, chapter number 10, verse number 31. And what you're quoting, that Gospel of John, chapter 8, verse number 20, is different. That I am what I am. So two different confusion. So, so, so you, you, you don't think that, that he tried to claim his divinity by using What you're statement. trying to say about casting of stones is Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said in the Gospel of John, chapter number 10, verse number 30, I and my father are one. Is that what I'm trying to say? Yeah. I, oh yeah, yeah. Okay. So I know your Bible better John, than you. John 8, 58 even says... 8, 58 says, I am what I am. That is different. I am what I am is because I am is the word used for God. Before me was I am. What he said is, before me was Be I am. Before Abraham. Before Abraham was I am. Before Abraham was I am. <laughs> before Abraham, if I am means God, so before Abraham was God, so what is the problem? Is there any problem? If I am means God, 
Before Abraham was God, there is no problem. And if I am me, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, it is mentioned in the Bible that God had the knowledge of everyone before he came in this world. God knew that Jesus Christ was going to come before Abraham was born, correct? God even knew me, I am going to come in this world much before I was born. So what is the problem? That doesn't mean it is divinity. What they are trying to do, because when Moses, peace be upon him, went to give the message to the Pharaoh, and he said, he asked God, what should I say? Who has sent me? God told him, tell him, I am his sent. And the word used there is, Eshehe, Eshehe. And in the Gospel of John chapter 8, verse 58, it is ego emi. The words are different. They are not the same. Now you, who don't know much about the Bible, get misled by the church. The word is different. It is ego emi. It is not Eshehe, Eme, Eshehe. Even though the meaning I am is the same. Even if I agree it is the same, it doesn't mean Jesus is God. It means before Abraham was God. You know what they are trying to do? Before Abraham was God and I am God. Where does it say that? Yeah, okay. Okay, so now for, you agree for, Jesus for, is not God. For, for that, um, now you agree Jesus is not God. I, I, be I, upon I, him. Okay, I understand that your, your terminology of the... Not my terminology, terminology of the Bible. I'm, I'm telling in Greek and Aramaic, not my terminology. So if it is the terminology of the Bible. So do you agree Jesus is not God? Peace be upon him. I cannot, I, I cannot say anything about that. So you believe in illogical things without proof. You are talking so much logic, this, that, Quran, difference of opinion. I'm asking you about your Bible and you cannot reply. That means you believe in something blind belief just because the church is saying you're following. You know, I had a discussion with many of your, many of your doctors of divinity. They could not answer. Not one single unequivocal statement from anywhere in the Bible where Jesus Christ, peace be upon himself, says that I am God, our voice is worship me. So why do you want to believe he's God? In fact, when a person came to Jesus Christ in Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 19, verse number 16 to 18, that good master, what good things should I do so that I shall enter eternal life, I shall go to paradise? Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, replies, why thou callest me good? There is only one good, and that is Almighty God. You can't call him good and you're calling him God. Where did he claim divinity? Where? Not my will, but God's will be done. If you say not my will, but God's will in Arabic, he's a Muslim. So where did Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, ever claim divinity? Not a single unequivocal statement. So if you are a seeker of truth, and if really you are logical and truthful, you should accept when you find truth. Or are you amongst those people who don't really want truth, they only want to follow their nafs, their desire? So I think I just I just maybe maybe I will I will study my Bible first. Yeah. And you and study, and I would like you to watch my video cassettes on similarities between Islam and Christianity. Similar Islam Christianity. And first, knowing about your God is more important than knowing about about other things. You know about your God is very important because if you worship the false God, you will go to hell. If you worship the false, you will go to hell. You have to worship the true God. So I pray to Almighty God that may He enlighten you. Jesus Christ, peace be upon you, the Gospel of John. Seek ye the truth, and the truth shall free you. But you should seek the truth, not have prejudice in your mind that I am right, even if you're wrong. So you seek the truth, inshallah, God willing, you will find the truth. Inshallah. Okay. Uh, thank you for, thank you. for your answer. You're most welcome. You're most welcome. Yes, sister. Uh, greetings to you, doctor. I'm Sharu, and I'm a Hindu. So I would like to ask you about life after death, which is, and so rebirth. I would like just to know uh, your opinion about it. So, yeah, about life after death and rebirth. What do you actually think about it, and what's your perspective of, a perspective of Muslim towards it? Sister has asked a very important question that what is my view and perspective about life after death and about rebirth and what is the Islamic perspective? That's a very good question. In Hinduism, 
normally use the terminology punar janam punar janam punar means next janam means birth or life so punar janam means next birth or next life which even islam believes in that islam says in the quran that allah brought you to life you will come in this world you will die allah will again give you life we believe in life after death even hindus believe that even vedas believe that but but the problem is that many of the hindu scholars they have come up with the concept of samskara the cycle of life and death and life and death and life and death samskara called as reincarnation this concept of reincarnation and samskara is nowhere to be found in the vedas vedas talk about punar janam if you read rig ved volume number 10 verse number 4 volume number 10 verse number 4 and 5 it speaks of rig ved speaks about punar janam next life which even islam believes which even quran talks now how did this philosophy of life birth life birth cycle and the philosophy of samskara came into existence because the hindu scholars they could not they could not justify that why are some human beings born handicap some are born with heart defects some are born in a poor family some are born in rich family so it seems that almighty god is unjust so to justify that god is not unjust making some people born handicap some people healthy some people rich some people poor they came with the philosophy that maybe that individual human being in the previous birth had done sin it was a philosophy that is promoted by the scholars of hinduism in hindu scripture sister there are two types of scriptures one is smriti one is shruti smriti is the word of almighty god shruti sorry shruti is the word of almighty god and smriti are the words of saints and sages in the shruti you have the vedas which is the highest and you have the upanishad in the smriti you have the puranas you have the itihas you have ramayan you have mahabharat you have bhagavad gita so when you read in the vedas there is no concept of reincarnation but concept of next birth is there the concept of reincarnation and cycle of birth and death is there in the puranas bradak puranas also in bhagavad gita which says that when a caterpillar climbs up a blade of grass it jumps to the next, next grass and in the purana that says that when when a body puts away its own clothes and puts on new clothes same way the soul puts on a new body this is not there in the veda it is there in the smritis based on this they say that a human being who says the scholars say that the living creature is born again and again and is born as a human being seven times if he does good deeds he is born as a higher creature if he does bad deeds if he does sin he is born as a low creature maybe cockroach rat maybe snake that is the philosophy sister i am asking you a question is crime and sin in the world increasing or decreasing crime in the world is definitely increasing actually increasing correct the population of human being increasing or decreasing increasing so isn't it illogical if the sin is increasing the human being should decrease yes it's kind of logical logical yeah. so it is illogical to say when sin is increasing even human being is increasing if sin is increasing human being should be born should be born next life as a cat as a dog as a rat as a snake so it's it is not logical now coming back what what is the answer so because the scholars could not justify why the human being born as a with a heart defect born in a poor family and imagine if a person leads the life we believe this is a test for the hereafter even hindus believe even christian believe even muslim believe this life is a test for the hereafter the christian believe we die and we are resurrected once the muslims also believe we died and resurrected once the vedas also say that but many hindus believe in this samskara why now imagine you go to swarg or you do a mistake you go to nark 
when you have got your punishment, why should you be born as a lower creature? When you get your punishment, you should be free. If someone drops this put in jail, when he comes out, he's free, right or wrong? Again, you can't put him back into jail. So when he gets his punishment in Nark, why did he come down in the world and again becomes a lower being? Why? It's not logical. If you go in the swarg, you got your reward, then why you come back in the test? Why again? So what we realize, this philosophy, because they could not reply that God is unjust, they came with this philosophy. Now what is the answer according to Islam? In Islam, we believe that a human being comes in this world once, and this life is a test for the hereafter. Once is enough, then there is a Hisab Kitab, Day of Judgment, and then you're put in Swarg on earth. Janna or Jannam, hell or hell. Now, how can you reply to the statement that some people are born rich, some people are born in poor family, some people are born handicapped, some people are healthy. This life, as Allah says in Surah Mulk, chapter number 6 and verse number 2, it is Almighty God who has created death and life to test which of his good deeds. And Allah says in Surah Baqarah chapter number 2, verse number 155, Surely we will test you with something of fear and hunger, with loss of life, with loss of goods, loss of goods what you have earned and toiled. That means anyone who has to go to work, Allah will test. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Anfal chapter number 8, that he has made your children as a test for you he has made your wealth as a test for you he has created your wife as a fitna as a test for you so your children are a test for you your wealth is a test for you now allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for example a person is born in, in a rich family so he has to give charity in islam that is zakat every rich person who has a saving of more than nisab level more than 85 grams of gold he or she every lunar year gives 2.5 percent of that excess wealth in charity so for the rich man he has to give charity zakat if he gives zakat maybe he will not give so he gets zero out of 100 maybe he'll give half he gets 50 out of 100 maybe he'll give full for the poor man he gets 100 out of 100 zakat he doesn't have to give zakat so we say garibe bichara poor man actually he gets 100 out of 100. We think, or a poor. Therefore, the Prophet said, it is easier for the poor man to go to Swarg, to heaven, to Jannah, than a rich man. So here, the test for the rich man is, Allah gave him wealth as a test. Does he give charity or not? If he doesn't give, he'll fail. For the poor man, he already gets 100 out of 100. Now again, coming to the next example. Some people, some parents, they are born with healthy children. Some parents give birth to congenital. Now, maybe one, one parent, mother, father, very pious, praying regularly, praying to God, they are born with, they give birth to a child which has congenital heart disease. Now, Allah is giving a more difficult test. Nowhere does the Quran say that the rich man will go to heaven, or a, nowhere does the Quran say that poor man will go to hell. No. Nowhere does the Quran say a, a child with a heart defect will go to hell. No. The test is for the parents. That do the parents yet believe in Almighty God or not? Maybe a, a parent who is not very strong in faith will say, Oh my God, I have been praying to you every day five times, yet you gave me a son which is a heart defect. They may start complaining. Now, in an examination, if the test is easy, the reward also is less. For example, you apply for a BA in Arts, Bachelor's in Arts. You pass, you become a graduate. When you appear for a medical examination and you pass medicine, doctor, you get DR in front of your name, correct? Why? To pass medicine is more difficult than to pass Bachelor's of Arts, correct? So more difficult the test, higher is the reward. So maybe Almighty God wants to test that parent by giving a child which has congenital heart disease. Yet they will say, oh, yeah Allah, oh, thank you God. At least you give me a child, Allah is testing them with wealth, with children, testing them. So maybe Allah wants to put them not in paradise, in Janat Firdaus. That's a higher grade of paradise. So Allah makes some human being rich, some poor, some congenital disease, some healthy. Because every year the question paper sister keeps on changing, correct? Every year if the question paper is same, then where is the test? So Almighty God tests different human beings in different ways, with health, with disease, with wealth, with poverty. So this life, sister, is a test. 
Nowhere does the Quran say that if you are rich, you will go to heaven or hell, or if you are poor, you will go to heaven or hell, or if you are healthy. It's the test. The child is masoom. Child has not done any mistake. It is the parents who are being tested by the child. And the child will undergo his test. You know, there's a saying, I have to complain to God that I had no shoes until I saw a man who had no feet. I have to complain to God because I had no shoes until I saw a man who had no feet. So person who's thankful to God, Alhamdulillah, at least I have feet. I'm complaining I've got no shoes. When you see a man who had no feet, so you should thank God. How many of us thank God for the niyama, for the blessings he has given us? How many of us thank for the water he has given us? How many of us thank for the air he has given us? If you don't breathe for a few minutes, you will die. So this life, sister, is a test for the hereafter. All these differences are a test. We come in this world once. In this world, we have many tests. You do a mistake, you ask for forgiveness, God forgives you. You do a mistake again, you ask for forgiveness, God forgives you. But in this world, you come once, once you die, then there is a hisab kitab, day of judgment. And then depending upon your good deeds or bad deeds, which is more, you will be put to heaven or hell, sister. Hope that answers the question. Thank you very much. It answers my question. The most welcome. Yes, Hello. Uh, good afternoon. Hello. Uh, good afternoon. <coughs> Hello. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Tanu Hui. I'm a visitor here. And my question is, let's say, um, the Prophet Muhammad did not exist. Let's say Islam did not exist. What do you think will happen to the world today? Brother said that what if Islam did not exist, what would happen to the world? You're asking me a question. If my mother and father did not exist, what will happen to Dr. Zakir Naik? <laughs> if my mother and father did not exist, then Dr. Zakir Naik would not have been born. Correct? So Islam, Allah says in the Quran in Surah Imran, chapter 3, verse number 19, in the dina, in the lie Islam, the only religion acceptable in the sight of God, in the sight of Allah is Islam. We human beings have been created as one of the wonderful, beautiful creations of Almighty God. And this world was made so that we came and Allah tested us. God wanted to test us in this world. So if Islam is not there, where is the question of this world being there? Do you understand? Islam means to submit your will to God. So if you say there is no God, what will happen to the world? There's no question of there's no God. Almighty God is there. He created the human beings. He told them your religion is Islam. As he says in Surah Maida chapter 5 verse number 3, on this they have perfected your faith and chosen for you Islam and complete my favor unto you. So this world is there because as part of the plan of Almighty God to test the human beings. So if you say Islam is not there, what will happen to the world? If Islam is not there, then the world wouldn't have been there. Uh, the world don't exist? The world wouldn't exist. Okay, thank you. That was fine. Idris. I come from America and I converted March 24th. My, my question is, so God is all-knowing. He knows the past, the present, and the future. My question is, is in, is in, in an Islamic point of view, what is the point of this world? Because if he is all-knowing, why do we not just go to where we are meant to be? Brother Idris has asked a very good question that Almighty God knows everything, the past, the present and future. And if he knows everything, then why don't we go to the end directly? 
I would like to give you an example. In a classroom, a teacher is teaching the student for a year. At the end of the year, the teacher can predict this student will come out first class first, this student second class, this student fail. Correct? And when the student predicts, what the student predicts mostly comes true because the student knows that this student is very intelligent first class first, this student second class, this student fail. I'm asking the question. If the teacher says, okay, now no examination, I fail you, will the person agree? Even the person who knows you're going to fail, will he agree? Right or wrong? So here, Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Fatir, chapter number 35, moment a human being is born, the Fatir is worn down the neck. Allah knows everything about the future. Now you are born. Allah says, okay, if you go to heaven, you will not object. Allah says, okay, you boy, you go to hell. He will say, why should I go to hell? Right or wrong? Allah knows. He says, go to hell. What have I done? I've just come in this world and you put me to hell. So Allah knows in advance, but Allah, you make the choice, not Allah. No, people ask about Takdeer. That if everything is written in destiny, whether I'm going to, whether I'm going to rob or not, if, I'm going to, if it's mentioned my destiny, I'm going to rob. Who's to blame? Allah is to blame. I'm asking the question, if the teacher predicts that you will fail and if you fail, will you blame the teacher or the student? You'll blame the student. The teacher knew that the student used to play hooky, he used to bunk class, see a lot of movies, never do his homework. Now here, Allah has given you a choice. But you are the person who chooses. Allah knows in advance. For example, after you pass your school, after you pass your A-levels, you can become a doctor, you can become an engineer, you can become a businessman, you choose to become an engineer. It's your choice. Allah knows in advance that at so and so time when you pass your A-level, you will choose to become an engineer. Choice is yours. But Allah will make a gap, knowledge of the future. Now everything what knowledge he has written now. But who makes the choice? You. For example, you come at a crossroad. Cross road number one, two, three, four, five. You choose road number four. Allah knows in advance on 11th of April, 2016, you will come at a crossroad. You have choice one, two, three, four. You choose road number four. It is not because Allah has written your, your choosing road number four. It is because you will be choosing Allah has written in advance. You understand? Yes. After you pass your university, you can be an honest person and work and earn a living or you can cheat and rob. You choose to cheat and rob. Who's to blame? You are to blame. Yes. Allah gave you both the choice. But Allah knows in advance at so and so time, after you pass your university, you can be honest, you can cheat. You choose to cheat. So who's to blame? You, not Allah. So here, if Allah puts the moment you are born, if Allah puts you in hell, you will object. Why are you putting me in hell? In the Quran, Allah says, on the day of judgment, no unbeliever will ever question to the justice of Allah. They will only say, please give us one more chance and Allah says it's over. Allah has given you umpteen number of chances in this world. You understand? So if Allah puts you directly into heaven, you will not object. But if he puts you in hell, you will object. So that's the reason Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this life is a test for the hereafter. The choice is yours. Allah has given you the guidance in the Quran, what is good and what is wrong. If you follow the guidance of the Quran, you'll go to heaven, Jannah. If you don't follow the guidance, you'll go to hell. So the choice is yours, better. Hope that answers the question. Thank you. You're the most welcome. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and good afternoon. I'm Amalina from UCSI University. Um, there has been a, a hot debate or dispute among Muslims whether to implement hudud or not. Some people want to go for it and some people object it because they believe that there's a lot of things to consider. So my question is, um, does it make us less a Muslim if we don't implement hudud? What is the last sentence? Does it make us less Muslim? Yeah. Sister asked the question, does it make us less Muslim if we don't implement the hudud, the death penalty? Hudud, death penalty. So death penalty. Uh, hudud. Hudud, the death penalty you're talking about. The death penalty, no? Yes. The hath penalty. Everything about hudud, yeah. And the hath penalty. Hath penalty. The sister asked the question, that does it make a Muslim a lesser Muslim if he doesn't implement the hath penalty? If Allah says in the Quran for certain crime, there is a hath penalty, you have to give hath penalty. For example, if someone rapes, 
according to the Islamic law, he gets death penalty. You say, no, I don't want to implement it. Then you're not a good Muslim. Because this is the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah knows what is best. If you don't give death penalty, then in America, every, every 32 seconds, you'll have one rape. We don't want our country to become like USA. Everyone looks up to it. That's the reason Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is our creator. If as a Muslim, Allah says very clearly in the Quran, Allah says in the Quran in Surah Azab, chapter number 33, verse number 36, it is not befitting for a believer, man or a woman, when the opinion has been given by Allah or his Rasul to choose for any other option. Anyone who does that is in the wrong. It is not befitting for a mu'min or a mu'mina, for a believer, man or a woman, after opinion has been given by Allah as Rasul, to choose for any other option. Anyone who disobeys Allah, he is in severe penalty. So it is no option. What Allah says, it's final. What a beloved prophet said is final. We have to follow it. There's no option system. Hope that answers the question. Thank yes. you. You're most welcome. Uh, I'm Rafiq uh, from Kolaturangano and I have one question here. Uh, when, when we have a dialogue with a Christian, there, uh, there is uh, the, the, most, the most question that they ask is, uh, are Muslims the only one that will go to heaven? So if the statement is true, how can we counter it uh, in a good manner so that they, they will not see Islam? as an uh, intolerance religion. Uh, if it is a, a mis misconception, then how we counter it? By providing a new verse in Quran or the hadith of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The the question that when the Christians ask the Muslim that will only Muslim go to heaven, how should we reply? You can change the phrase. You can say, anyone who submits his will to Almighty God will go to heaven. Anyone? who submits his will to Almighty God, he will go to heaven. It's the translation of the word Muslim into English. Because the word Muslim people have allergy to it. So if someone has allergy, you remove the allergy. So that means a, a non-Muslim will not go to the heaven? A non-Muslim cannot go to heaven. Because the criteria to go to Jannah is given in Surah Al-Asr, chapter number 103, verse number 1 to 4, which says, Wal Asr, Inna al-insana by the token of time, man is verily in a state of loss, except those who have faith, those who have righteous deeds, those who exhort people to truth, and those who exhort people to patience and perseverance. There are minimum four criteria for any human being to Jannah. Number one is Iman. Number two is righteous deed. Number three is exhorting people to truth, that is doing Dawah or Isla. Number four is exhorting people to patience and perseverance. Iman is number one. If you don't have faith, if you don't believe in Allah, if you don't believe in the final messenger, you cannot go to Jannah. You may be a very good human being, giving charity, may be great. I'd like to ask you a question. Yeah, but, 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 it, and they will say it is not fair for them because Christianity is the biggest population. Let me complete my answer. No, no, you can stand there. What? Asad. Don't interfere, no? Don't interfere, no? No, no, you can come on the microphone. I'm telling him not to interfere. Okay. The thing is that, that to pass standard 10, when I appeared in my ICC examination, they said compulsory six subjects. English language, mathematics, science, history, geography, Hindi. I will tell you, I passed in five subjects. 100 out of 100. In science, I got 10 out of 100. Will I pass standard 10? Yes. Will I pass standard 10? How much you got? There are six compulsory subjects. Out of six compulsory subjects, five subjects, I get 100 out of 100. One subject, I get 10 out of 100. Will I pass under 10? No. Why? Because compulsory subject. So there are four criteria to go to Jannah. Iman, faith, righteous deed, dawa, and exhorting people to patience and perseverance. If anyone is missing, you shall not enter Jannah. So if Iman is missing, how shall I go to Jannah? Just because Christianity is the largest religion, that does not mean that it is right. There are more people who don't believe in true God. Does it mean that God doesn't exist? There are more people believing in false God. Majority doesn't win in Islam. In Islam, the truth wins. I told in my talk, 
in surah isra chapter number 17 verse number 81 wa qul ja al haqq wa zaqal batil inna al batil kana zauka when truth is heard again falsehood falsehood perishes for falsehood is by its nature bound to perish truth is important not majority hope that answers the question thank you bismillahirrahmanirrahim assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh my name is Naina Chahda from Yuniza. Actually, I have two questions, but my first question is uh, quite the same with uh, this now, which is, if there is a child asked, um, if Allah already decides whether we go to Jannah or we go to hell, then what is the uh, purpose of Allah creating us in the first place? That's the first one, but uh, you already uh, answered it just now, right? And the second one is, um, Allah is Almighty as we know, but uh, is, he, is He can create something that He couldn't destroy? destroy. Um, and what is the best answer for uh, sister this asked kind the, of question? Sister asked the question, what is the best answer to a question like, can God create something which He cannot destroy? It's like a person is asking me that my brother, Tom. My brother Tom was admitted to the hospital. He gave birth to a child. Is the child girl or a boy? My brother Tom gave birth to a child in the hospital. Is the child girl or a boy? Can you guess girl or a boy? Is the child girl or a boy? What is it? Girl, why not boy? My friend is coming and telling me, asking me a question. My brother Tom, he was admitted to the hospital. He gave birth to a child. Was the child girl or a boy? Boy? <laughs> no, 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 no. Girl also wrong? Boy also wrong? Who knows the answer? Raise your hand. Who knows the answer? Raise your hand. University of Malaysia, Taranganu. Only, only one percent, girl or a boy? Girl or a boy? Ah, now understood, no problem. Is it a girl or a boy? Can a man give birth to a child? No. no. The definition of man is a man cannot give birth to a child because a man doesn't have a womb. You understand? So similarly by definition, all these are illogical questions. These are illogical questions, non-existing. Do you understand? Like oh, you are who created God? By definition, God is uncreated. So where is the question of who created God? Do you understand? So all these questions are illogical questions. I, must, I saw a tall short man. I saw tall short man. Do you understand? Tall short man. Can they be a tall short man? Can they be a tall short man? Yes. What is the height of a tall short man? Huh? You know in Bombay, I have a fat thin man. You know fat thin man? No understanding. Who understands tall short man? You understand, no? Tall short. What is the height of the tall short man? Fat, thin man. A man can either be fat or can be thin. Can be medium, can be fat, thin. All these are illogical questions. Oh it's like you asking me a question. What is the weight of that fat, thin man? No, they cannot be a fat, thin man. He can either be fat or he can be thin. He cannot be fat, thin. Do you understand? So these are illogical questions. You reply them in the same manner. That my friend, my brother Tom, gave birth to a child. Was it a girl or a boy? You reply this, then I will tell you. The answer for can God create something which he cannot destroy? Hope the answer is the question. Thank you so much. Excuse me. Okay, uh, say, 
mungkin soalan terakhir ya, sebab kita mengejar masa nak masuk waktu zuhur. Saya ingat uh, saya allow untuk soalan terakhir. Saya minta maaf untuk yang lain yang tak mampu nak tanya soalan. Saya tahu ramai yang menunggu untuk tanya soalan. Tapi masa tidak mengizinkan. Uh, saya allow satu soalan lagi boleh ya. Eh? Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Qad Allah Taala innad din indallahi al-islam that uh, that is no religion beside God uh, except uh, Islam. Okay now by the globalization world today uh, as we know there some ideologies like uh, pluralism, secularism, socialism uh, or other like nationalism Uh, by this ideologies is that all of this are from Islam but I can't understand you can you speak a bit louder and clearly uh, the ideologies uh, ideologies it, yes uh, pluralism nationalism secularism uh, is this Uh, from Islam? Brother asked the question Is secularism, nationalism from Islam? Islam is Islam and secularism is secularism. Both are different. Islam means submitting a will to Almighty God. Secularism is something else. Nationalism is something else. Islam is you submit your will to God. If any law of any country, anything else, matches with Quran and Sunnah, you have no objection in following it. If it goes against Quran and Sunnah, you cannot follow it. So in Islam, we have to follow the Quran and the Sahih Hadith. If what anyone, any other way of life, says something which Quran permits, no problem. If they say something which Quran doesn't permit, you cannot do. Hope that answers the question. Can we have the next question? Last question? Last question. Inshallah, right. the last question, inshallah, before we end the session. Yes, sister. Yeah. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. My name is Wan Shahira Bintu Abdul Rahim. I am UMT. Um, first of all, I want uh, to make uh, my friend's favor wish. He asked me to send you his regard. So, uh, my question is, uh, as we know, before we are born, Allah has arranged our life journey, our religions and our faiths. But, of course, we are not perfect. We could make a mistake. If we live our life in a wrong way, can we say that it is all have been arranged or we have choice to live our life? If we have choice, why does Allah arrange us our journey? Thank you. If I understood the question clearly, that we live our life which Allah has already destined, So if you do something wrong, why is Allah destined in the wrong way? Sister, this question was asked earlier about destiny. About destiny, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what is going to happen in the future. But you are the one who chooses. Allah has given you the guidance in the Quran. What is right, what is wrong. If you follow the Quran and you, and you implement on it, you will go to Jannah. It is not Allah is writing and you are following it. It is because you will be doing it, Allah writes in advance. The answer I gave earlier, it is the same. So you are the one who chooses your own decision. Allah has ilm gab knowledge of the future, so you can't blame Allah for that, you have to blame yourself. So if you make a mistake, you rob, you are to blame. If you cheat, you are to blame. Allah did not tell you to cheat, correct? Allah gave you the option, you can be honest, you can tell a lie. If you choose to lie, why should Allah blame? Allah has knowledge of ilm gab He knows in advance that you will be cheating, you will be lying. So he writes in the taqdeer that on so and so date you will lie. But you are to blame not Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if you really want to change, you change yourself and inshallah you will go to heaven. Inshallah, I hope that answers the question. Thank you very much.